in the 19th century, we haven't really talked about the rise of nationalism. Nationalism is really one of the most famous events that really happened uh, in the 1800s, especially with Europe uh, overall. Then I will get into and talk about uh, imperialism, which I think is often called new imperialism, uh, which both those are major causes of World War I later uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So I'll get to those today. Probably spend more time on really nationalism more than anything. So if you have any comments, questions about this lecture during the live stream, uh, you know, do let me know. Uh, or you can always leave me comments later on my channel. Uh, or you can also email me if you got a question about the class uh, also uh, as well. So anyway, I'm going to first go ahead and I'm going to talk about the rise of nationalism, which nationalism was a major event that really, uh, like I said, changed Europe a lot, like drastically. The map of Europe was pretty much changed later. Uh, a lot of this came uh, in the aftermath of the revolutions of 1848, which I've kind of touched a little basis on a little bit uh, prior, I think, in these uh, lecture series on the 19th century. But a lot of it, you know, you had the age of Metternich, where Clemens von Metternich with the Congress of Vienna uh, tried to keep conservatism uh, pretty much stable in Europe. Uh, but that gets eroded by the rise of nationalism, which really takes off. And nationalism is really one of those major events that really uh, changed the course, really, of Europe. And they think it was a major cause of why World War I, uh, later World War II, uh, happened uh, as well. So both those are definitely caused by it, uh, for sure. Uh, kind of a scary word today. I guess nationalism is now being replaced by globalism or something like that. And people prefer that over nationalism. But Nationalism back then was a major, major thing. Uh, here's kind of, kind of expand a slide right here, but uh, you can see that the concept of it was the idea of creating a modern state uh, in Europe. Uh, most nation states refer to a country that represents a group of people uh, living in a similar geographic region, like an area of Europe or wherever it is throughout the world. They might have a common language, common history, culture, traditions, uh, it could be also similar ethnicity as well, uh, or even religion. You could say things like that uh, also uh, as well. Uh, and um, you can see that, um, yeah, uh, if you think about this, they think that modern nationalism, like, like the, the origins of it anyway, uh, they think we're heavily influenced by several things. The French Revolution definitely you know, influenced it. Uh, also, the rise of Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon's, you know, conquests of Europe uh, spread the ideas of nationalism or nation-state ideas. Uh, Places like Germany, Italy, uh, etc. Even in Latin America, <clears throat> ideas of liberalism, radicalism, those kind of things also were part of it. And then don't forget people having just national pride about being a certain ethnicity or nationality, uh, etc. Were definitely other causes of it also as well. <clears throat> now, um, Europe itself, you know, <clears throat> at that time was, you know, you think about Europe, uh, like if you go back to like the early 19th century uh, in general, there, were, there's basically, you know, they're, like these countries here, Italy, uh, Germany, you know, Greece, Hungary, Poland, uh, they didn't exist. So none of those countries really existed at that time, uh, most of the major European nations were like Britain, France, uh, Austria, Russia, Spain, Portugal. You know, those are your major countries uh, throughout Europe at the time. And so these countries will come later, like between the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, especially the first two on that list. And I uh, will talk mostly about them uh, overall today. Let me go ahead and first talk about something that was kind of real popular, though, uh, in the early 19th century, and that was uh, Greek independence. Uh, I don't know if you know much about that, uh, but uh, it's around 1830s, uh, 32, I think, to be exact. And you have, of course, the Greek independence movement uh, that took off, uh, and um, they had a conflict that was called different names, uh, the Greek War for Independence, I think the Greeks call it also the Greek Revolution, sometimes Revolution of 1821. Uh, and prior to that, most of that region of Europe 
like in the southeastern part of Europe, was controlled by the Ottoman Empire, which you can see Greece on the bottom there, where the Ottoman Empire is in that map. So that was an area that they wanted to be independent, partially because the Greeks were Christian, like Orthodox Christian primarily. Uh, the, of course, the Turks were Muslim, and so they wanted to break away uh, and become more independent. Uh, and so uh, Greek independence was heavily backed by countries like France, uh, Britain, uh, Russia, uh, because, you know, all those three countries were Christian. Uh, also, they also saw the Greeks as being like the birthplace of, you know, Western civilization. And so a lot of volunteers went there to fight. Uh, I think there's a story about, um, I think this man named uh, Lord Byron, you may have heard of him. You see in that picture on the right, uh, was a famous Romantic poet. He actually went over there, fought in the Greek War for Independence, and actually died during the war, I think in 1824. And so um, <clears throat> this was a very popular movement uh, and um, Greece got their independence mostly because of the fact that the other powers sent armies and naval forces uh, to fight uh, against the uh, Turkish Empire. <clears throat> and uh, the peak battle was the, the Battle of Navarino, which happened in October of 1827. And uh, the Turks were, their, their naval force was just destroyed uh, in, in that battle <clears throat> in October. And so after that, the Greeks were able to, you know, get their independence afterwards. I think this week, I think it's, uh, I want to say March 25th is the date. That's the, the day that the Greeks celebrate uh, Greek Independence Day. So, yeah, the Greeks was definitely one of those first states to really uh, get, their, get their independence, uh, you know, at that point uh, in Europe and become like a separate nation state. Uh, there are other countries that break away, too. Uh, most of them are in, under the Ottoman Empire, like Belgium, of course, uh, that's separate. Uh, they 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 kind of formed their own nation state uh, in 1830. But Romania, Bulgaria, Kingdom of Serbia, you know, countries like that, uh, they kind of break away from the Ottoman Empire, in that part of Europe, kind of west of the Black Sea, uh, and uh, they, they become independent states also as well. Uh, that kingdom of Serbia is an inter interesting one, too. Uh, Serbia, you know, is one of those states that helps to start World War I, uh, 1914, which I'll, of course, get to later. Now, one of the things I want to talk about next, which is real big, uh, of course, that happens in you know, Europe uh, in the 19th century, of course, is uh, Italian nationalism really takes off. Uh, in in the 1800s, and uh, they think that Italian nationalism was something that was started uh, by this man uh, named uh, Giuseppe Massini. You see there uh, in that image, he's one of uh, several major leaders of the Italians that were kind of involved in creating Italian nationalism, and then eventually the unification of Italy uh, later. Uh, it was often called the, um, the, the nickname they dub it is usually the Resurgimento, is what the Italians called it, which uh, I think Resurgimento in Italian means uh, resurgence. Uh, it was a resurgence in Italian pride and uh, having a unified Italian state. Uh, and Massini was one of the, the figures that really was involved in trying to, you know, nationalize all of Italy into one unified state. And... Um, He's one of uh, <clears throat> several um, leaders. So if you kind of, kind of go back to that picture I just showed you a second ago, uh, but they're often called the um, Fathers of the Fatherland. That's the nickname they often call a lot of the men uh, in Italy that helped to unify it uh, into one Italian state. Uh, Massini, uh, Victor Emmanuel II, who was a king, uh, Count Cavour, uh, of course, Garibaldi, who's very famous, and there's, there's their images right there, Messini, Cavour, and Garibaldi, who was a very famous Italian general uh, in, in the 19th century. <clears throat> and so all those men really helped to, you know, help to unify Italy long term. Uh, Messini formed this secret society uh, in Europe that was called Young Italy. It was founded around 1831. It was mostly comprised of men uh, they were around 40 and younger, and um, they favored uh, 
unifying Italy, but as a democratic republic. That was one of the things that they favored. And Cini was considered radical uh, for his time. Uh, and uh, because of his radical nature and all that, his movement, uh, he was later exiled. That's one thing about it. Uh, because of, you know, the age of Metternich and uh, I guess he, he was forced to flee Italy to other states. And he wouldn't really come back to Italy until after Italy actually unified, uh, which is later. Uh, now, kind of explain, like, why why is it that uh, Italy, uh, you know, had such a tough time? I'll get to you know, uh, Cavour in a second. He's kind of very instrumental. He was kind of the brains behind the whole uh, Italian unification uh, movement. Uh, at the time, uh, most of Italy was heavily controlled by two powers, primarily. Uh, most of it was controlled by Austria, especially in the northern territories. And the southern part was kind of controlled by the Spanish indirectly uh, through a uh, kingdom and dynasty that was called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. And um, so all this control was basically, you know, uh, in foreign hands, and there was very few states that actually were independent uh, in Italy. Uh, however, there was one state I did want to mention that's pretty important uh, with the whole unification uh, of Italy, and uh, that is the Kingdom of Sardinia, uh, which uh, you can kind of see it's at the top left, and it's also the island of Sardinia uh, as well. Uh, that was the only actual major independent state that was really uh, in Italy, uh, it kind of went back to the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, uh, 1324. It's around till 1861, uh, and it's a has a dynasty that's called the House of Savoy. It's got territory called Savoy uh, that's right above Piedmont uh, in northern Italy. Savoy, I think, now is a separate area that's under the French now, uh, but <clears throat> they control that area and that purple area in the northern part of Italy. And they also controlled the island of Sardinia, which is right below Corsica. Uh, they had a capital. <clears throat> the capital you can see, uh, you can see that where it says Piedmont, is was a capital called Turin, also called Torino uh, as well. And uh, eventually by the 1850s, it became a constitutional monarchy. And it was ruled by this king named Victor Emmanuel II, who's considered one of the fathers of the fatherland that helped to unify Italy. And it was run with a bicameral parliament. And eventually uh, in 18, <clears throat> 18, I think, I want to say 50s, uh, Count Cavour, uh, you see in that image right there on the left, he would become the first prime minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. And then later, he would also become the first prime minister of Italy, uh, the kingdom of Italy, uh, which will form later. Uh, and... Um, He's considered to be really one of the, the most important figure, really, uh, that really you know helps to unify uh, Italy. I think they say that um, Mussini was the heart of the Italian unification movement. Uh, Cavour was the brains behind it. And I'll get to later, Garibaldi, you've heard of him, famous Italian general, was the sword of the whole uh, unification movement, of course, in Italy. Uh, now, one of the things that happened to unify Italy, one of the things that Cavour did, Cavour made this uh, deal with uh, Emperor Napoleon III uh, that was later called the Plumbledis Agreement, which I think was a verbal agreement uh, that was made between uh, <clears throat> Napoleon III and the uh, Second French Empire and uh, <clears throat> the Kingdom of Sardinia uh, in July of 1858. <clears throat> and what the agreement was, was that Napoleon III would help to drive out Austria, uh, their forces out of like northern Italy, in exchange for territories that the um, Kingdom of Sardinia had, which was uh, Nice, where the city of Nice is, now part of France, and also Savoy. So both those areas were given to the French, I think by 1860, uh, later on, uh, which I think Garibaldi wasn't too happy about because that's where he was born uh, in Nice. Uh, and um, that became part of a treaty called the Treaty of Turin, uh, signed in 1860 between France and later the Kingdom of Italy. And so that sparked a war 
uh, in Italy, that later was called, it had all kinds of names. Uh, the Italians usually call it the Second Italian War of Independence. Uh, I think some people call it the Italian War of 1859. Um, I think it's got all kinds of names. I think they dub it uh, Austro-Franco War, something like that. It's got all kinds of names. But basically, with the combination of the French uh, Sardinian forces, which were led by Garibaldi, uh, they were able to drive the Austrians out of northern Italy. Uh, and so that war ended within just a few months. It was a very short war. It only lasted like a few months. And uh, what ended up happening was the Sardinians then took control of most of northern Italy, I think minus Venetia, which they'll later get in 1866. That was part of the so-called Treaty of Villafranca. Uh, and so that they start combining that territory kind of where that red line is uh, in the middle of northern Italy in that map. So that area, they start to push the kingdom of Sardinia down more towards uh, towards Rome. Uh, and at one point, they even moved the capital to uh, Florence uh, from Turin at that point. Now, of course, I was talking about Garibaldi. Uh, he, of course, very, very famous figure also in the uh, unification movement. Uh, Garibaldi was this Italian general uh, and revolutionary, uh, and uh, he had nicknames. And some people called him the red one because he would wear these reddish shirts in battle, uh, and his men would wear red shirts as well. Uh, and so uh, they were later, his forces were sometimes called the red shirts uh, in Italy. He also had other names like the hero of the two worlds because he fought in Europe, but also in a bunch of revolutions in like South America. He was a very wanted general everywhere because he was considered a military genius. I think it was even a case during the American Civil War where Abraham Lincoln tried to get him to come over to America to fight the Confederates. Like the, he was going to give him command of the Union armies, uh, but he turned him down and all that. Uh, and uh, what Garibaldi's famous for, his forces, uh, the Red Shirts, uh, actually had a nickname. They were called the Expedition of the uh 1,000 or 1,000, which I think had like 1,100, 1,200 men uh, in his force. And they invaded the southern part of Italy, uh, which I told you was controlled by the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Uh, and with his forces, they were able to eventually take Sicily first from the south and then push up into Naples uh, towards Rome. Uh, and then later, all that territory will eventually be annexed, of course, into uh, the kingdom of Sardinia. Uh, and really that state down there, uh, the kingdom of Sardinia was really, a, that, that kingdom of the two Sicilies, it was really weak, weak state. They were able to march in there and easily just take it over uh, at that point. Uh, eventually, um, what happened was uh, Garibaldi eventually met with King Victor Emmanuel II. Uh, I think Garibaldi had favored a Republican state that was the only thing I think that Garibaldi was kind of fighting for, which I think he kind of supported Messini's idea of that. Uh, but eventually they kind of agreed on a unified state that becomes a kingdom of Italy is what occurs. So kingdom of Italy is, is born 1861. Uh, it'll be, of course, last until 1946. Uh, Victor Emmanuel II will be one of two rulers of it. He's got a son later uh, named Victor Emmanuel the a third who reigns later. And um, Cavour, who we talked about, would become the first prime minister of the Kingdom of Italy, but he would only live a few months after uh, he would take power. Uh, if you go back to that map uh, I showed you uh, a second ago, uh, I think I've got right here on the right, right there. Uh, they eventually do uh, take Rome. Rome is also added uh, into also Italy as well, uh, which they will do uh, in 1871. And the Pope and the Catholic Church, which had controlled the Papal States area, which went back to like the Middle Ages, going back to the Franks, they lost that area. And so the Pope only has the Vatican City left like to rule over uh, in Italy. And Rome, of course, will be the capital of pretty much Italy from 1871, of course, to the present. But like I said, uh, the, the Italians will have a you know uh, monarchy 
uh, until 1946 after World War II. And then now, now of course, today, uh, it is a republic overall. Now, I'm going to get into next. I'm going to discuss also a little bit into, uh, also get into talking about German unification as well, because that's the other major issue that comes next in Europe. And they think that was the, the most important thing uh, that really changed Europe drastically, you know, changes the whole balance of power in Europe uh, is because Germany unifies, of course, in the late 19th century. So uh, German unification began really uh, under uh, Prussia. Prussia was the major power that really caused the unification uh, pretty much of the German state later. Uh, this occurs under Wilhelm I, uh, who's later called Kaiser, as you know. Uh, and uh, I'll get get to it later, but um, we'll talk mainly about Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck's really the, the major figure that really uh, is the brains behind really the unification uh, of, of Germany right here. There, of course, Bismarck right there. Uh, Bismarck, of course, a little bit about him. Uh, he was a German politician uh, that was really the brains, like I said, behind the German unification. Uh, he came from the Junker uh, aristocratic uh, class uh, in Prussia. And uh, eventually uh, he held the position of prime minister uh, of, of Prussia originally, which I think they called it, I think back in those days, a uh, minister president. He was also the um, main foreign minister of Prussia for a bunch of years uh, overall. Uh, Bismarck is very famous uh, for his nickname. He's often you know, known as the so-called Iron Chancellor. You might have heard that term being used for uh, all about him. And um, he was called that because of a speech he gave one time uh, that was called the famous Blood and Iron speech uh, when I think he became uh, Prime Minister of, of um, Prussia at the time. And uh, Bismarck stressed the need for military preparedness uh, to solve what they call the German question. The German question was this idea of what was the best way to achieve, you know, unification of, of, of the German people, like throughout Europe. Uh, and he felt like the best way uh, to really do that uh, was to drive the Austrians out of the German Confederation, which controlled that part of Central Europe at the time and then unify all the other German states in what he called the Greater Germany, of course. So they're going to try to drive the Austrians out, uh, basically. And um, he had a famous uh, speech he gave, like I told you, called the Blood and Iron Speech. Uh, he said famously that the great questions of our day cannot be solved by speeches and majority votes. That was the great mistake of 1848 and 49, but by blood and iron. He's talking about the revolutions of 1848 uh, and all that. And so Bismarck is going to be the one that's going to eventually unify the state. He's really the brains behind it. And I'll kind of talk about some major events that really lead to uh, German unification in, in the late, late 19th century. So that's uh, Wilhelm I, who was the, the Hohenzollern ruler uh, of Prussia at the time. Uh, you could see that most of Prussia was in the northern part of Germany uh, today and also part of East Prussia. Uh, that's now part of Poland now. You see, all those are all the major areas that they controlled. And then the southern areas are going <clears> to <throat> eventually unite with it as well to create this German empire uh, that, of course, form uh, later. Now, I'll kind of talk about some major events that really led to it. They believe that the, 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 one of the first things that really helped to unify Germany together uh, was a famous war, which has all kinds of nicknames. Uh, Austro-Prussian War, I think it's one common name. Uh, they often called it. And it also, uh, they have also other names. They call it the German War in Germany, of course, was another name they called it. And then some people call it the Seven Weeks War because it only lasted seven weeks uh, in about June, July of 1866. And um, there was a cause of this war. Uh, apparently, there was a conflict uh, between uh, Prussia and Austria over what they call Schleswig-Holstein, which is an area, by the way, that's kind of part of like Germany, I think part of Denmark now uh, in the northern part of Germany. And uh, 
it was often referred to as the Schleswig Holstein question about where that territory should be part of Germany or should should it be part of Denmark. And so they think that helped to cause conflict between the two states. And then war broke out, of course, in the summer of 1866. Uh, and so uh, it was really a war that Austria, you know, regretted uh, and uh, forces under uh, the general uh, Helmut von Mulkey, which were more advanced than really the Austrian side, they basically just routed uh, the Austrians in a quick, quick conflict that only lasted just, like I said, a few weeks uh, between June, July of 1866. And uh, Prussia was backed by also the Kingdom of Italy uh, in that in that conflict. Uh, and so uh, Mulkey is like one of several, you know, famous Prussian generals that were well known, of course, uh, in, in the 19th century. Also think of like uh, Gebhardt, you know, Blucher, which I think we've talked about, who bowed Waterloo uh, and all that. Uh, I think Mulkey had a nephew later that was also uh, Helmut von Moltke the Younger. He was not as good as him, but uh, he was also a general also uh, in World War One. I'll kind of talk about this particular conflict, by the way. Um, they think that part of why the um, Prussian side was more successful uh, was the fact that it was one of the first major wars where they started using bolt-action rifles, which you can see there, the so-called Dries needle gun uh, was first used uh, in that conflict, which uh, breech-loading rifle is a type of rifle where you can load the actual bullet you know, into the chamber you see instead of through the muzzle at the top, uh, basically. And so that proved to be pivotal, really, uh, in the war. And uh, that picture I was showing you earlier, that was from the Battle of Konigsgratz, Konigsgratz, which uh, was fought, they think, at Bohemia in July of 1866. That was considered really the most pivotal battle, really, uh, of the Seven Weeks War. And they do think that the bolt action rifle did play kind of a major role in it because the um, Prussian side had 220,000 troops and the Austrian side had 250,000 troops. They actually outnumbered uh, the Prussian side, uh, but the bolt action rifle proved to be obviously, you know, because they could shoot, shoot faster you know, with a bolt action rifle more than a muzzle loading type rifle. Uh, and so Austria suffered like 44,000 casualties, which most of that was like, Troops that were captured, by the way. The Prussians only, only had like 9,000 casualties, kind of give you an idea about that battle. So, so that battle was kind of important, Koenigsgratz, uh, in really leading to eventually, you know, Germany unifying. And so one of the things that happens after, after that war ends is that Germany then unifies in the north. You get this new state that kind of forms... Uh, which is called the North Northern, it's got different names, Northern German Confederation, or also the other name they call it is the North German Confederation, uh, which really helps to alter the balance of power uh, in Europe, because you got this now new unified Germany that's starting to come about uh, at this point. And um, it is around from about 1867 to about 1871, uh, roughly. And um, this this actual new German state is going to be the prototype to the Federal Republic of Germany, which will you know, form later, of course, in the 20th century. And so you'll start to see Germany starting to unify uh, at that point. Uh, this confederation, by the way, had a, a population, you can see, of like something like 30 million people living under it, which 80 percent of the people, of course, that lived on it, under it were in Prussia, of course. Uh, Three-fourths of that area will be, of course, part of the so-called German Empire uh, that they'll have later. Uh, I think some of my ancestors that lived in Prussia were living in the western part of it, uh, which would be kind of far left part of the map, called the Rhineland. It's like around the Rhine Rivers, where a bunch of my relatives came from, on my father's side anyway. So anyway, uh, so now I'll also talk about this other thing that happened, too, uh, that occurs, of course, uh, because of the fact that, oh, and by the way, I want to back up here. I forgot to, forgot to talk about one more thing I did want to mention about this state we're talking about, which is the North German Confederation. Uh, it is a constitutional monarchy. That's, that's something that you do see 
uh, pretty much that's created because Germany's going more towards a constitutional monarchy. Uh, King Wilhelm, of course, becomes its ruler of it, of course, as the monarch that reigns over the state. Then Bismarck will become the chancellor of it, which we'll use that term later for also Germany uh, when he's the chancellor of Germany uh, as well. They do have an elected parliament, which is called the Reichstag, uh, which is uh, direct representation, of course. They do have the Bundestag as well, which was more of a, a council type assembly, which was more people appointed to it, uh, which is later. But the Reichstag was the main parliament where you could get elected to it uh, throughout the state. And it's later under um, also the Weimar Republic in the early 20th century uh, as well. Now, yeah, I did want to talk about also what happened to, uh, because of Austria losing that war, uh, they do have this thing called the Austro-Hungarian uh, Compromise that occurs uh, in uh, 1867, which occurs between Austria and Hungary, which really the only two states that really had any power uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, it was caused by discontent uh, with Hungary. Hungary had by the way, revolted back in 1848. They had this thing called the Hungarian Revolution of 1848. And uh, I think the Austrians had practically ruled over it like a dictatorship afterwards, but they wanted more rights uh, afterwards. And so they get this compromise uh, between the two states uh, that form. And um, you can see all the territories of, of what becomes Austria-Hungary, of course, later uh, by going into the early 20th century. And the Hap House of Habsburg uh, basically would recognize there's these two main states. You got the Austrian Empire, and then you got the Kingdom of Hungary, and they basically rule with one single monarch uh, that would reign over both of them. I think they sometimes called it an emperor king, is what it was referred to later uh, overall. So the Habsburg ruler would be Habsburg reign, uh, emperor of Austria, and then also the king of Hungary uh, as well. Uh, the weird thing about these two states uh, is that uh, they um, had separate parliaments. It's weird. So Hungary had a parliament, uh, Austria had a parliament. Uh, they even had separate prime ministers. There would be a prime minister of Hungary, prime minister of Austria uh, as well. But they, had, they shared a common military. So the Austro-Hungarian military would all fight together, like in their armies or their navy uh, as well. And uh, the main ruler of this state, which we've talked about before, will be, later be Emperor Franz Joseph I, who was one of the longest reigning rulers of the Habsburgs, especially Habsburg reign dynasty anyway. And uh, he'll reign from 1867 to 1916. He's the monarch when World War I, of course, will break out. But it's kind of like a constitutional monarchy uh, also as well. But people in Europe will later call it Austria-Hungary or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it's one of the major states that you know, lead into, of course, World War I. They don't cause it, especially with the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Uh, now, the other big conflict that really caused the unification of Germany uh, is the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, this conflict uh, was a major conflict in Europe in the late 19th century that occurred between the North German Confederation, of course, and the second French Empire of Napoleon III. And so these two would go to war. Not too many other powers back either side, of course, uh, in this war. I'll kind of explain like some causes of why uh, the war broke out. Uh, but we'll, we'll see this war is kind of important. It's a decisive war that really leads to the Germans winning and also helping to unify the German state uh, into an empire, uh, which will emerge, of course, uh, in 1871. And uh, it's kind of weird about this war. This war was actually a conflict that they think was caused by actually neither side. It was caused by apparently an incident that happened in Spain. Uh, in Spain, they had a revolution breakout, which I think was sometimes called the Gl Glorious Revolution of 1868, uh, where revolutionaries overthrew uh, Queen Isabel II, who was a Bourbon ruler, they put in a democracy of some type, uh, which was a provisional government uh, in the state. Uh, but they eventually, they eventually get overthrown, and they, they decide to put a monarchy back in, 
And uh, Prussia favored putting in this monarch that was named Prince Leopold. He was a cousin of King Wilhelm I. He was actually a Hohenzollern, a cousin of his. But Napoleon III of France, uh, Second French Empire, he didn't want a Hohenzollern ruler in there. He wanted someone else that was non-Hohenzollern. And so there was the one he wanted to put in power was uh, Amadeo I, uh, who was Italian. He was like related back to the House of Savoy, King of Sardinia that becomes Italy. Uh, and so that's the two sides that basically, you know, the different ones that are there. Uh, apparently there was an incident where there was a telegram sent uh, by uh, Bismarck uh, about uh, him and uh, King Wilhelm with the French. And uh, there was a deal where uh, the French had asked uh, Wilhelm uh, if he would, apparently what happened was uh, Amadeo uh, was the one that eventually gets the throne. Uh, and what happens is Leopold decides to um, revoke his uh, candidacy for the actual throne of Spain. And Wilhelm said that he would still back Prince Leopold if he decided to, you know, do a second time, maybe if he wanted to renew his candidacy or whatever. And so um, Bismarck took whatever Wilhelm said, like remarks wise, uh, and he kind of changed what he said a little bit, shortened it a little bit. And so the uh, M's telegrams, they called it, uh, kind of implied that Wilhelm was insulting the French uh, by his kind of showing still some support of Prince Leopold. And so that's that's actually what provokes the war between basically France and, and of course, uh, the North German Confederation, mostly led by Prussia at that point. So both sides eventually uh, mobilized uh, in the summer of 1870 uh, because of this. Uh, and it's going to be no contest. Uh, this particular conflict. And of course, what ends up happening is the German forces invade uh, through northeastern France, come through the eastern border, close where the Rhineland is, uh, you can see uh, in that map. And um, they invade with an army that close to like some like 200,000 troops, which was probably more than the French had. I think the French only had like 130,000 troops that they amassed uh, to fight. And uh, the pivotal battle of the Franco-Prussian War was a battle called the Battle of Sedan, which lasted basically three days, September 1st uh, to September 3rd, uh, 1870. And what ended up happening was the German forces actually encircled the French, the main French armies that were around Sedan uh, near the Belgian border uh, at that point. And uh, one of the most famous things that happened with that, if you know about it, was that the German forces actually captured most of the of the actual French army that was there. They actually encircled it, and a little over 100,000 French troops actually surrendered as prisoners, prisoners of war. And it included also the capture of Emperor Napoleon III, uh, who you see in that image there uh, with uh, Bismarck kind of sitting next to him on the right. Uh, that's a very famous image, basically. And so, yeah, the end of uh, Emperor Napoleon III is kind of a farce. He kind of, his whole empire collapses right afterwards uh, because of that. And uh, what's going to happen is eventually the French are going to declare another republic uh, at that point, which I think is the I think it's the second French republic that kind of comes in. Actually, the third, excuse me, the third, third French republic will be founded uh, at that point afterwards. Uh, although there is a case where the um, some of the French were kind of radical. Uh, I think they're called the Paris Commune, kind of seized control of the country, which were led by com communists and socialists and things like that, but they only lasted about two months on uh, Paris. But what happened was from there, the Germans then laid siege uh, to Paris, uh, which lasted about four months uh, from September in the fall uh, to about January of 1871. And eventually Paris was forced to capitulate uh, in, in basically in the war. Uh, from there, what happened then, the German Empire then formed. Uh, January 18, 1871, uh, Wilhelm becomes Kaiser. He's now German emperor, uh, basically, of Germany. Uh, and so the so-called German, German Empire 
or I, I think that what the the Germans call it is the Dutch Reich is what they say it the German Reich or German Empire, uh, which forms and it lasts from 1871 to uh, 1918 in World War One, and uh, there'll be three rulers that will be uh, German emperors uh, that'll reign till World War One. Of course, Valon the Second I'll get to later is the most famous one that'll be later. Uh, Bismarck, of course, you know, the brains behind the whole you know, unification of Germany. He would become the first chancellor of Germany uh, afterwards. And they did have a treaty that was signed between both sides, between the French and the and uh, the Germans. It was known as the Treaty of Frankfurt. That officially ended the Franco-Prussian War. And uh, Germany ended up getting Alsace-Lorraine, which is kind of close to the Rhineland. Uh, it's on the Eastern, northeastern part of France, they get that territory. And um, the French will have to pay the Germans something like 5 million uh, indemnity, uh, which are kind of like reparations. And that kind of sows the seeds between the hatred between the French and the Germans, uh, which will kind of continue you know, into World War I, World War II, uh, and all that. Uh, they think the Franco-Prussian War is definitely a war that they think later influenced like World War I. Now, I'm going to, of course, move on uh, to talk about, you know, we'll kind of get into uh, other other issues in 19th century, like, like imperialism. But you can see the map of Europe after that. This is Europe in 1871. You can see this new state, the German Empire, uh, which is kind of formed between Russia and now France. And so that's going to help to cause the imbalance of power uh, in Europe. Uh, Germany is now going to be a rival state uh, to other powers like France the British Empire, uh, the Russian Empire. And so that's going to help to later cause, you know, World War I uh, to break out, which we'll talk about that, of course, next week. Now I'm going to get into next, I've got some time left. I want to talk about also uh, what they call new imperialism, which was something that was big uh, that started in the 19th century, and it kind of goes up to uh, World War I. Uh, in the late 19th century, uh, you got up to World War I, you got this period where they have an age of imperialism, where all these powers in Europe start to try to create colonies throughout parts of the world, Africa being the most famous, of course, parts of Asia, uh, the Pacific, uh, close to the Indian Ocean, uh, and all of that. Uh, and so they often refer to it as being called new imperialism uh, because of the fact that the Europeans were trying to exploit all these areas of the world uh, because of economic reasons, which they think had an e extension as part of the uh, like age of capitalism, which was beginning in the 19th century, which had to do with that also the Industrial Revolution, which we talked about that had already started. And so they wanted cheap natural resources, cheap labor, cheap, cheap new markets, you know, to uh, you know, exploit and sell goods to. And also areas to colonize because parts of Europe were, were becoming you know, overpopulated, and so they wanted to move to certain areas, be able to own land and uh, things like that uh, overall. Uh, you can see this map here. You can see those are the different areas of the world uh, that were, you know, at one point taken over by uh, the Europeans. Uh, Africa, most famous, of course, they had the so-called scramble for Africa, uh, as they called it, uh, where, you know, they start carving up different parts of the world, even in Asia, of course, you've got the British, especially in Asia, uh, of course, taking over all these areas uh, overall. Uh, of course, um, there's a difference between old imperialism and new. Old imperialism went back to 16th century, you know, going back to the conquistadors and up to like the 18th century, where conquest of the Americas was the big thing that was starting to kind of take off uh, the most uh, overall. But then you can see new imperialism is more focused on, you know, pushing into parts of Africa and Asia. Those are some of the major powers, Germany, Italy, Belgium, they're the ones that kind of were in it, especially the British. The British and the French uh, were the ones that were probably the most famous. United States, uh, Japan also got into it uh, as well. Spain and Portugal were kind of involved too, but they were already kind of involved on certain parts of the world at that time. Uh, overall. Uh, even the United States got into it, like Manifest Destiny. You know, that's something that we hear about, of course, uh, in the United States, which was a you know a movement to 
push, you know, uh, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, the East Coast to the West Coast uh, in the United States. And you can see here that, you know, uh, eventually all that was territory that was taken from other powers. Uh, Louisiana purchased from France. Uh, Republic of Texas was gotten mostly from the Spanish. Uh, you can see the southwestern areas of the United States, California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, parts of New Mexico were gotten from the Mexicans. Um, northwestern part, of course, gotten from the Brit, Brit, British also as well, like Oregon, Idaho, Washington, Alaska from Russia, Hawaii from the Polynesia. So we, we took all that territory from other people, you know, over time. And also we Philippines, we go into the Caribbean, you know, and things like that uh, also uh, as well. But I want to talk about the British. Uh, really, when you think of the British, uh, yeah, um, they were the ones that really were the model uh, for people to want to imperialize and colonize uh, different parts of the world. Uh, we had talked about how the British Empire at one point controlled like something like one fourth of the world's landmass, especially by the 1920s uh, overall. And uh, their empire at one point would control Canada, part of the Caribbean, uh, British Guiana and South America, Belize uh, and Central America, Egypt, Sudan, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Rhodesia, I guess, uh, India, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and even parts of like China at one point. So the, uh, yeah, their empire was vast, you know, in size. And I think the size of their empire at one point was like 11 to 12 million square miles, which was a huge, huge amount uh, of territory. Uh, imperialism was also part of, like, don't forget, national pride. And so you had this case where uh, people had what they call jingoism, where they felt like they had a right to go into these areas and spread, spread, you know, uh, their their ideas and civilize people uh, and things like that. And uh, you may have heard of uh, this um, writer uh, named Roger Kipling, uh, who uh, he's one that wrote the famous book called The Jungle Book. You may have read or maybe seen movies about The Jungle Book. Uh, but he had a poem that was called White Man's Burden, uh, which kind of summed up, you know, British imperialism, uh, that they had to go in there and, and, you know, civilize people and make them like the British people and things like that. And it's kind of a form of racism now, I guess, today is seen as overall. Uh, but that's kind of what they saw it as uh, back in the back in the 19th century, uh, roughly. So white man's burden, that kind of summed it up. Uh, now, uh, one of the things I'll kind of talk about uh, when you think about British, they think British imperialism was heavily influenced by this man named Dr. David Livingston, uh, who lived in the 19th century. You may have heard of him. Livingston was this Christian missionary uh, that went to Africa, hoping to convert all of the Africans to Christianity. Uh, but he wasn't just involved in that. Uh, he also explored parts of Africa, which I think one of the main things that uh, Livingston was looking for, he was trying to find the source of the Nile River, uh, which he thought was Lake Victoria. Uh, and so he would explore parts of East Central Africa. But they do think that Livingston was a major you know, influence, of course, uh, on why the British would try to colonize what they called the Dark Continent uh, back then. And uh, there was a time at one point where Livingston around 1870 disappeared. They were like, oh my God, they can't find him. They thought maybe he had been killed by Africans. And so uh, the New York Post, I believe was the newspaper, sent this reporter named Henry Morton Stanley to try to find him, if you know the story about this. And he found him near Lake Tanganyika, which is, by the way, uh, close to where Tanzania is today. Uh, and he said famously to him, Dr. Livingston, I presume, uh, and so uh, that became basically uh, the influence of Livingston. And I think also uh, Henry Morton Stanley was an influence because he would later go on to uh, become an explorer himself, exploring Africa. I think Stanley was the one that would actually find the source of the Nile. You find like where the rivers go into Lake, Lake Victoria uh, and all that. Uh, and um, they believe that Stanley was the one that's kind of in influence a lot of these other powers to try to 
try to colonize eventually uh, afterwards. And uh, it's going to lead to eventually, like, like Belgium is going to go into like the Congo uh, area, which is in the central part of southern uh, Africa. And uh, they'll, they'll colonize that area uh, right there. And um, under King uh, Leopold II, uh, they'll control that area of the Congo from the 1880s up to the early 1900s, like before World War I. And I don't know if you know about Leopold II. He was kind of infamous for a lot of atrocities happening under him. Uh, they exploited mostly the Congo because the Congo had a lot of uh, natural rubber, like rubber trees that were grown grown there. And so they would harvest the you know the rubber, like the latex liquid from it, to make like natural rubber uh, back in those days. Now they have synthetic you know rubber now, also as well, but. Uh, it, it caused supposedly millions of deaths uh, throughout uh, the Congo, which I think the number of deaths vary from 1 million to as high as like 15 million uh, Africans may have been killed or somehow died from anything from disease. And they even had cases where they would cut their hands off. I think they cut their hands off because they wouldn't do the work or whatever. And so they chopped their hands off, that kind of thing. Uh, and so... That was considered to be really considered examples of colonialism, how it kind of was seen as very you know, awful and uh, some of the negative aspects of it, of course, that would occur uh, to make you know, rubber you know, and all that stuff like that at the time. Uh, now, uh, another thing that happened, too, uh, because of what happened with Stanley and others going into Africa, uh, the Germans had this conference that they had in Berlin uh, in 1884, uh, which was backed by Otto von Bismarck. And uh, the idea was to divide up various spheres of influence where the Europeans would have their certain areas that they would control. And so it's after that that really Africa gets divided up into these different areas that you see map lots. Uh, and so uh, French West Africa, you can see, is mostly in that red area right there, which will include countries like uh, Algeria, um, parts of like Chad and other areas, Morocco, et cetera. Those are all the areas that will be controlled by them. Uh, the British were all over the place. Nigeria, like I said, Egypt, Sudan, uh, parts of like uh, down into Kenya, also later into parts of East Africa, but especially South Africa will be an area that they'll, of course, control. Uh, Spanish, not much in Africa except the Western part, of course, there, but Portuguese had areas like where Mozambique is and uh, Angola. Those are areas that the Portuguese control at one point. Of course, Belgium's in the Congo, like I said. Uh, Germany had like parts of East Africa, but also South Southwest Africa uh, as well. Italy later again, like in Ethiopia uh, as well. But you can see there were very few areas of actual Africa that were independent uh, by the late 19th century. Uh, Ethiopia, that's actually one of the last areas that is not actually conquered uh, and taken over uh, by, by the Europeans, uh, which they called it back in those days, Abyssinia, uh, which was an ancient kingdom uh, that went back for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, uh, but later, it'll be actually conquered by and taken over by the uh, Italians. I think Mussolini later will conquer it. Uh, you read about that later, uh, and I think in the 1920s. It'll be later. Uh, they do have Liberia. I don't know if you hear about that, but that was another state that was kind of like independent uh, that really didn't get taken over by the Europeans. But that was a state that uh, America helped to support uh, because there was a movement in the United States back in the 19th century, uh, which was a back to Africa movement where some Africans wanted to go back to Africa and things like that. And so that's what led to its creation and all that and why it exists now, of course, today. I think Marcus Garvey, you may have heard of him. He was an example, a Jamaican-American uh, that was kind of involved in trying to start that movement for Africans to go back to Africa. Yeah, you can see the extent of the British Empire, you know, how vast it was, but they had the most colonies, you know, pretty much overall uh, in Africa. But I'll talk about other conflicts that were also big, uh, that were like at the end of the 19th century uh, that you had. You did have this thing called the Boer War, uh, which broke out 
uh, in what is South Africa. Uh, and this was caused by the fact that you had the British slowly taking over South Africa, but you had other people living there that were had been there a long time. Uh, the Portuguese, the Dutch, you know, go back to like the 16th century uh, in in South Africa. And uh, they're often called Africaners, of course, later, but the term they used back then was boer, B-O-E-R, which was a Dutch word that meant farmer, which most of them were. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, because of the fact that the British kept moving in uh, to South Africa, uh, many of them decided to move northward in what became known as the Great the Great Trek, where these uh, mostly Dutch people uh, pushed northward and eastward uh, into, I guess, the now the eastern part of uh, South Africa today. And they migrated into areas that are now called Natal, Transvaal, you may have heard of, and the Orange Free State, which are now part of South Africa today. Uh, and so uh, they migrated there to get away uh, from, from the British. Uh, but the British eventually moved there too. <laughs> they moved there as well. Uh, and uh, they think a lot of that was caused by the fact that uh, they found gold and also diamonds so throughout that area that they could mine. And so that's what actually caused uh, the conflicts. And uh, there were actually two Boer Wars. There was one that was called the First Boer War, where uh, they were actually successful, uh, where the Boers uh, were able to get somewhat independent in that area, 1880s. Uh, but uh, after they found gold and you know diamonds in that area, that led to more influx of the British. And that's what they think would cause eventually the so-called you know, second Boer War to break out, which is actually what they usually call the main Boer War, uh, which was fought between 1899 to uh, 1902. Uh, considered one of the, of the first, by the way, first major war, I guess, going into uh, the 20th century, uh, the, the Africaners were outnumbered. They only had about 100,000 troops. Uh, you can see those are actually Boer forces on the left right there. And on the right, the British Empire had like half a million troops uh, that they had. Uh, you can see you can see some British troops on the right with machine guns uh, right there. And uh, one thing about the Boer War, uh, besides being really one of the first major wars that kind of goes into uh, the 20th century, it is one of the first modern wars that really influences like later World War I. Uh, machine guns, uh, trench warfare, use of camouflage and barbed wire and things like that. A lot of that gets used a lot, of course, uh, in in this particular conflict. Uh, and um, so trench warfare is something you'll, you'll start seeing more of going into like uh, future wars uh, later. And in the end, uh, the, the Dutch side lost. They lost the war. And so Britain became in more control you know, over basically South Africa. They also go into like where Rhodesia is now Zimbabwe and colonize that area uh, also as well, which a lot of that had to do with like finding like diamonds and gold also in that area as well. Uh, other conflicts that the British were involved in too, uh, which are very famous, uh, is the Opium War. So I'll kind of talk about that a little bit uh, as well, uh, which the Opium Wars uh, go back to, to different parts of the, of the 19th century overall, which there are actually two of these. Uh, different conflicts. Uh, they had the opium, first Opium War, 1839 to 42, and they had the second Opium War, 1856 uh, to 1880. Uh, the Chinese uh, at the time was reigned by this dynasty that was called the Qing Dynasty, or also called the Great King or Qing, uh, that ruled uh, China going back to the 17th century, 1644 to 1912. Uh, they're sometimes also called the Manchu because uh, they originated in Manchuria. And um, that state became weaker uh, by the time they got up to the 19th century. And uh, the Europeans start to kind of carve out like spheres of influence uh, over it. And uh, one of the things that the British did was they started to corner the market on opium. Uh, it was a narcotic. Uh, and Eventually, the Chinese tried to have it banned, but uh, the the, the, China, the British military was just too powerful. Uh, and eventually, in the Opium Wars, the British Navy practically just wiped out the Chinese Navy 
uh, they're junk chips. <laughs> and anyway, um, basically from there, they were forced to agree to a treaty, which became known as the Treaty of Nanjing or Nanking, uh, which was in 1842. And what it did was it created a bunch of these treaty ports uh, in China on their coast, uh, which the British and other powers could trade there. Uh, like the British got Hong Kong uh, pretty much after that. And then uh, they start getting all these other other cities they start to carve up uh, as well, which I've got here. I'll show you which are a bunch of them. Hong Kong, Shanghai, Canton, you may have heard of. Of course, Nanjing as well. Hankow, Jiang, Jiangshu, Jiangshou, and uh, Chongqing also were other, other cities that they eventually you know take control over and trade with. And so within so many years after that, you can see how China gets controlled by all these different foreign powers, uh, not just European, but Japanese uh, also uh, that come in uh, and control of different areas uh, of that area. So Russia's in like Mongolia, uh, Japan controls like Korea, Taiwan, uh, Manchuria, uh, and also parts of Eastern China uh, as well. Uh, Britain controls like most of the eastern, southern part of China, like especially around like Hong Kong and all that. Um, the French are also in control too. French are in like southern part of China and also into Indochina uh, as well. So all these areas are dominated uh, by different uh, foreign powers. Uh, then also the British were in India. Don't forget, uh, India was really the cornerstone of the whole British Empire. Uh, especially under Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901. And uh, India was very important because uh, they were a big supplier of a lot, a lot of their raw materials to make goods, you know, in the Industrial Revolution. And um, for a long time, uh, India, going back to like the 18th century, was reigned by this, were controlled by the Brit British East India Company, uh, which originally got the charter, by the way, going all the way back to, you can see, Queen Elizabeth I. That's pretty far back uh, overall. And um, it was regulated from London, but uh, if you know about it, the East India Company was actually controlled by, they had their own army, the British East, East, East India Army that they had. They had some British troops that were in it, like probably the officers, but most of the actual troops that were in it were Indian soldiers, uh, which were called sepoys, uh, and uh, apparently there was an incident that happened in the mid 19th century. You may have heard of that was called the they call it different names, the Great Rebellion, I think, of 1857. Uh, but a lot of people call it the Sepoy Mutiny or the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857. And what happened was the Indians, mostly in central India, rebelled uh, against the British, uh, which lasted like something like a year and a half that took for them to put down uh, the mutiny. And uh, because of that, the British uh, were forced to take direct control uh, over India afterwards, uh, which they will start in 1858. And so they put in like a viceroy or governor that controls it under the monarch, Queen Victoria, and it was a viceroy. And so after that, India was known as the Raj, is what they called it afterwards. Uh, and so from 19, the 19, I guess mid 19th century up to like probably right after World War II, uh, the British will control India uh, for many years, which that's an area that's, by the way, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, I think is the main areas that were in it. And then also the British controlled, you know, where Burma is, of course, uh, today, or Myanmar. My, yeah, Myanmar is the other name they call it too, as well. Uh, but yeah, the British do help to, you know, uh, industrialize the country as well. Don't forget about that because, uh, you know, uh, they help to, you know, industrialize, build lots of railroads, you know, throughout the country and modernize it. You know, that's one thing about, I think, I think at the time after they did that, the, the India had like the third largest railroad network, of course, uh, in, in the world. There's, of course, the sepoys that revolted. Supposedly they revolted because uh, there was a rumor going around that there was um, the cartridges that went into the rifles. Uh, they're using like fat 
from like either a cow or uh, from pork. And so they revolted. And they think it was really more like nationalist movement early on because Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi later is going to you know, start a whole Indian nationalist movement after World War II to break away. That'll lead to the partition of India, 1947. That's later, 20th century, when that happens. Uh, one more thing I'll talk about, too, that was a big part also of imperialism is the Boxer Rebellion uh, that broke out in 1900. That might have been one of the last major events, of course, of the 19th century uh, that you have. And uh, what happened was uh, in... Um, we had talked about how um, the uh, the Qing dynasty, the great Qing dynasty, was declining uh, at that time. And uh, there was a lot of resentment in uh, China with these foreigners that were trying to take over the, the country. And so they think this ignited the so-called Boxer Rebellion, which actually started in 1899. It will last until like 1901, but people often call it that uh, overall. And you have these nationalist movements that started uh, under the Qing dynasty where uh, they formed these nationalist movements uh, like uh, the Society of the Righteous, I think, was one of them. But they had one that was called the uh, Harmonious Fists, which uh, a lot of the Europeans called them boxers because uh, they used like martial arts. They look like boxing. So they're called boxers, uh, basically. And they ran around with a slogan, which was death to the foreign devils. They wanted to basically kick out all the foreigners uh, out of the country. And um, it broke out in uh, what is, um, there's kind of some of the soldiers that were kind of involved in it, but it broke out in Peking, uh, Beijing, it's where the rebellion started. And so eight different nationalities, uh, different countries were involved in trying to put it down. Uh, Germany, United States, uh, Japan, uh, and other powers in Europe, Russia, British, uh, et cetera, all sent forces in there uh, to basically crush it. It's not like 20, 30,000 troops were involved in, in the actual Boxer Rebellion. And uh, the Boxers killed something like 32,000 uh, Chinese Christians were actually killed, uh, including about maybe 200 Western missionaries. And they think the Boxer Rebellion was pretty bloody. Uh, close to about 100,000 people uh, were actually killed uh, in the Box Rebellion, but they do think that the uh, the one thing about the uh, you know Box Rebellion, uh, they do think it helped to really cause the decline further of the of the Qing Dynasty because uh, it's going to eventually collapse in 1912. And what's going to happen is China is going to form a republic, the Republic of China, uh, which was founded by uh, one of the politicians in China you may have heard of named Sun Yat Sen. Uh, considered one of the fathers of the Chinese Republic. So that is one of the last major events, really, uh, that you have, really, of the 19th century that's kind of big, uh, the Box Rebellion. Uh, but all those events will later help to, like I said, cause, you know, uh, World War I later. You know, the rise of imperialism, rise of nationalism, uh, those are major events. I'll be definitely talking about more, of course, again uh, next week, because, like I said, next week we'll of course, focus more, of course, on the 20th century in uh, World War One. So before I go, don't forget, uh, like I said, you have assignments out there. I think those are the main ones right now. You've got the second vocab. I uh, know uh, I still, you can still turn that in this week, by the way. Uh, bonus video quiz on the Devil's Island Penal Colony. That's still out uh, as well. And I am posting, like I said, the new second exam, uh, which I think will be due in early April. I'll kind of give you a lot of time on that one, but that's going to be on uh, the topics, which are French Revolution, Asia Napoleon, and only the first two lectures, of course, on the 19th century, not this lecture. I'll put that probably on another quiz later. So that's pretty much it for today. It doesn't look like there was any questions, I don't think, uh, overall. And I'll see y'all, of course, next week. Y'all have a great weekend uh, coming up. Uh, you know, y'all take care.